We started talking about uh, spline interpolation. Um, it is an interpolation method that means given a set of points, sort is a spline function that hits all the points. Um, and um, we are looking for cubic splines. So this might look like we are doing now polynomial interpolation with cubic polynomials. That's what we do, but we do it just given two points and in between the two points we want to have a cubic polynomial and between the next two points we get a different cubic polynomial. Yeah? Um, and of course at these uh, intersection points we want to have um, Um, no discontinuities of the function, of the first derivative, and of the second derivative. Huh? And this gives us, for each uh, inner point, two extra conditions. So for every uh, subspline, we have two conditions from the left and right neighbor point, or let's take an inner one, two conditions from the left and right uh, point, and two conditions for the first and second derivative. And th uh, that means we have for all inner points, or inner subsplines, um, four conditions for the four unknowns of our cubic polynomial. <coughs> So it's a well-defined problem um, and we have a particular situation for the first and last subspline uh, because only one of these uh, two points is an inner point and the other one is a point on the margin and here we are missing two conditions. Uh, we are missing two conditions and therefore we have the freedom to add two extra conditions to our uh, spline problem and for a so-called natural spline uh, we add the condition that the second derivative on the first point and on the last point uh, is equal to zero. Okay, and we use such, uh, so we use uh, cubic polynomials, but in this particular form, so we don't have just x cube, we have x minus xi cube and xi are our data points, the x values of our data points. Um, and we use this particular form because it makes the math a little bit easier. Yeah? And why is the math easier? Look, I mean the interesting points are our data points. And when you substitute our data points, so when you substitute here, um, when you substitute x equal to xi in this formula, then this term, this term, and this term, they are all zero. Uh, and that makes it easier. Uh. Yeah. And here we have our requirements. This means all our subsplines have to hit the left, the, the point on the left margin of the subspline. So S0 has to hit this point, S1 has to hit this point, and S2 this one. Um, And this is the, uh, the requirement that the last subspline has to hit the last point. Um, this is the intersection condition between two subsplines. Look, SI, SI plus one. And uh, so the, this is the right 
uh, neighbor point of this subspline and this is the left neighbor point of this one. And so this, uh, this ensures continuity at all the points. This is the same thing for the first derivative. It ensures continuity of the first derivative. And here we have the same thing for the second derivative. OK. Um, and now we can start doing some uh, a little bit difficult. Not, no, no, uh, not difficult. It's actually everything easy. It's just substitution of one equation in the other and so on. Uh, but it's a little bit lengthy. And I don't uh, really do the whole thing here. Uh, you can read it if you're interested. Um, yeah. I mean, basically what happens is we replace in here as i, as i prime, and so on, our ansatz. So we just take the ansatz, our spline function, and really substitute it in all these equations. And then we could actually stop. We would get a linear system, a linear system with 4n, 4n equations for 4n unknowns. Yeah? I mean, here, here two equations are missing, but we will use these second derivatives at the left and right margin, and we, will ha we would have 4n equations for 4n unknowns. I mean, that would be really easy. You just substitute the ansatz into our requirements, and then you have the system. But that would not be too nice. First thing is, we would have 4n equations. We would have a linear system. Oh, why is it a linear system? It's easy to see on this slide. Why is it a linear system? You can already see it here. I mean, not everything is linear here because it's a cubic polynomial. We are not talking about a linear polynomial. But why would we get a linear system? Why do we get a linear system? Yes? All equations depends on x. On x? Yes, and, and that's the problem. And the problem is x appears cubic, not linear. Now, first question, when we talk about a linear system, we, of course, have to know what are our unknowns. Before we don't know this, we shouldn't talk about any equations. What are the unknowns? Yeah, yeah, the coefficients, a, i, b, i, c, i, and d, i. And if you look at these coefficients, the, our spline is linear in all coefficients. It is nonlinear in x, but it is linear in all coefficients. OK, but of course, now we have to make sure that we don't lose this linearity when we replace the ansatz into the requirements. We don't lose it. Why? I mean, here, in these first three uh, equations, it's no problem at all, because we just, we just take Si, and then we use some different value here. We, we use Xi plus 1 for x. Yeah? But that doesn't matter. What matters are the coefficients, and they still appear linear. But now, how about this one and this? first and second derivative. Does it change anything? No. Why not? Because these derivatives 
are with respect to x. I mean, we would get 3 times x minus xi uh, as the first derivative. And that doesn't matter. It's just a constant factor. So all the equations we get are linear equations. And that's why finally we get a system with 4n linear equations for 4n unknowns. How do you solve such a linear system? Now, what algorithm do you use? Gaussian yes, of course, Gaussian elimination. What's the complexity, the time complexity of Gaussian elimination? n cube, yes. n cube. And now suppose, and this is quite realistic, we have 100 or even 1,000 points. Suppose we have 1,000 data points. Suppose you have some CAD application and then you put a lot of points and then you want to have a smooth curve through all these points. 1,000 points. And then we use Gaussian elimination, I mean with, with 1,000 points, we would get 4,000 equations for 4,000 unknowns. And then an n-cube complexity, that wouldn't be nice at all. I mean, that, I guess that might, uh, might take you at least minutes, if not hours, of computation time. Um, okay, but I mean this is bad news, but now comes the good news. The good news is that the, the calculation on the following pages up to here, this calculation, uh, it involves some little tricks and at the end we have two good news. The first good news is we reduce the number of equations and unknowns from 4n to n. So we reduce the number of unknowns by a factor of 4, which is really good news. And second good news, no, um, at uh, already at that point, if we reduce n, the number of equations, by a factor of 4, we would reduce with Gaussian elimination the computation time by a factor of 4 power 3, which is 64. And that's not too bad. I mean, from one hour we would come down to one minute. But the second good news is we don't need to use Gaussian elimination. We can use a much more efficient algorithm which uh, has only linear complexity because the shape of our linear system is a particular one, which you will see in a minute. Okay, but now, now let's go back and look at the relevant points. Here, in this box here, you have four equations, no, actually four, four n equations. For the a, i, b, i, c, i, and d, i, I mean, that's actually what you want. You want a formula to calculate all these coefficients. Okay, um, but unfortunately here on the right hand side you see uh, some new variables called y i double prime. What is, what, what is y i? What is y i? Is it a variable or what is it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're right, it's the right hand side of some equation. But what is the right hand side? What is it? Is it a variable or is it a value? Is it a function? What is it? It's a function value. No, it's not actually not a function value. It is the y value of a data point. Given are the pairs x, i, y, i, our data points. 
So it's just a y value of one data point. So, so uh, y, these yi's, here, here for example, it appears. This is just a number. I mean, if you have the data point plus 1 minus 7, then this is minus 7. Okay, and these yi double prime are not second derivatives of data points because that doesn't make a sense. I mean, what is the second derivative of minus 7? It doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense at all. And therefore, this is not a second derivative. Please remember. Uh, this is the name of um, some value. Okay? This is just the name of a number. And, uh, and now the question is, of course, how do you compute this number? Uh, I mean, this is the trick in this whole derivation. Uh, we introduce these new numbers, y, uh, y1 through yn minus 1. And you see, these are only n numbers. And finally, you have to solve a linear system for these n unknowns. And I, at the end, I will explain you why they are called yi double prime. I mean, we could also call them ci or mi, whatever. Huh? But it makes sense to, to have the double prime there. OK, um, and now here you see the next box, which is important for solving this blind problem. Um, for i equal 1 to n minus 1, you have to solve these n minus 1 equations. And you have to solve them for these unknowns, for these yi double prime. And now look, they appear linear. Here, here, and here. You have yi minus 1 double prime, yi double prime, and yi plus 1 double prime. And now remember, these are n minus 1 equations. So if n is equal to 1000, we have 999 such equations. And now my question is, how many unknowns do appear in all these 999 equations? How many? So, how many variables or unknowns do you have in one particular of these equations? Say in equation number 500. How many unknowns are there? Four? Four? Yeah. No. Hmm? Only one? Only one? No. How about 500? No, no, sorry, not 500. How about 999? Because, I mean, we have a linear system with 999 equations for 999 unknowns. So how about 999 unknowns in one particular equation? But that's not true either. So now we have 1, 4, 999. I mean, look, look at the equations. Here they are. I mean, the answer is so simple. It's, it's a 3, of course. Yi minus 1, yi, and yi uh, plus 1 double prime. These are the three unknowns in all our equations. And that makes this linear system so simple. We have 999 equations. And in each one of the equations, we do have three unknowns. Oh, somebody said there is only one unknown per equation. That would be very nice. 
Why would that be very nice? Because we wouldn't have to do anything. We would be finished. I mean, then we just could solve every one of these equations for this yi double prime variable and we would be uh, finished. Um, but so now with uh, three unknowns per equation, we have to do a little bit of elimination because in each one of these equations, we would have to eliminate two unknowns and then we are finished. Okay. Now, um, okay, I didn't introduce this hi. Yeah, let's go back one or two slides. Here we have the definition of hi. hi is xi plus 1 minus xi. Um, and let's go back here. Look, x0, x1, x2, x3. And now h. Uh, let me see, what is the hi? Yeah. So, um, for example, this length here is h0, this is h1, and this is h2. It's just the width of these intervals between two successive x values. Okay, so these hi are uh, constant values and if we do have a fixed interval width between these xi, then all hi are the same value. Uh, so for example, if the uh, different distances between the xi are 1 all the time, then hi, they are all 1. So that's easy, these hi, here we have them again. Here we have the yi, which are just the y values of our data points. And yeah, I mean, in these hi, for computing them, you need the xi. So that's where you, uh, you uh, apply the xi. And here you need the yi, and then you can set up the whole system. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I already told you that we use this natural spline condition, which means y0 double prime is equal to yn double prime is equal to 0. Yeah? So the first and last unknown, they are set to 0. Yeah? And that's why we have only n minus 1 equations. Yeah? Because, I mean, we actually have n plus 1 of these unknowns. Look, we start from y0 double prime up to yn double prime. These are n plus 1 unknowns. But two out of these n plus 1 unknowns are already known because they are 0. And therefore, we have n minus 1 unknowns remaining. So we have this system with n minus 1 equations. And now let's look at in a particular example. Yeah? So we take n equal 5. n equal 5 means we are given 6 data points. Um, and then we get n minus 1 equations, which is 4. And here you see we have a matrix, a 4 by 4 matrix. And this is a so-called uh, tridiagonal form. We have three diagonals which are non-zero. This one, this one, and this one. And all the rest here is zero. So uh, this lower triangle is full of zeros and, oh sorry, and this upper triangle here is all zeros. And if this is, if n is large like uh, 1000, 
then this is a large area of zeros and this one too and we just have such a such a such a band through this matrix it's also called a band matrix um, and if you multiply this matrix with this right hand side you actually get equations which look like that look you get h i minus 1 times y i double prime y i minus 1 double prime h i minus 1 plus h i yeah? and um, yeah now look here here we have h1 plus h2 2 times h1 plus h2 in the uh, equation number 1 if i is equal to 1 you get h1 plus h0 here no? that's what we have here in the first equation in the second you get h1 plus h2 and so on okay and the right hand side this r here is a vector and all the ri are given by this equation and if you look at this this is exactly what we have here <coughs> okay now you know everything to determine um, cubic spines <coughs> let me um, repeat so what you do first is first step is set up this band matrix second step is set up the right hand side vector R third step is solve the linear system after solving this linear system you know these all these double prime variables when you know these double prime variables then you go back into this box here substitute them here and here and you then you know the coefficients and when, once you know all the coefficients then you substitute them into the polynomial so you might do the following you might then say as i of x is equal to a i times or oh, let's let's take s1 a1 times x cube plus b1 times x squared plus c1 x plus d1 okay no no you don't do that and I hope you remember this for the examinations so many students do exactly this in the examination and the result is false why is this not correct X minus X1. yeah yeah thank you so x minus x1 cube and here x minus x1 1 squared and also here x minus x1 I mean if we start with this then of course at the end we have to use our coefficients in this way otherwise we get nonsense I mean you see I learn from the faults of my students the important question is whether the students learn from their faults I hope so 
But no, the important question is whether you learn from the faults of your predecessor students. I hope so. Okay, um, now let's, let's uh, now we know what to do and we will apply this procedure to a tiny little example. This is an example that might um, be part of the examination. It actually was part of a previous examination. Okay, given are these points, the origin, 1, 1, and, oh, sorry, I don't see the other points, so let's look at the picture. These are the points uh, that are given. Given is this point, the origin, 1, 1, um, 2, 0, and 3, 1. These four, four points are given. And you already see the spline solution. Huh? This is our spline function and what's very nice is you see it is continuous and the first derivative is continuous too. I mean what we can't see is what's with the second derivative. But we will do the calculation and um, Okay, so given are these four points, and as you already see from these four points, is that these hi, they are all equal to one, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's written here. Um, the number of points is four, and um, our points are numbered from 0 to n, and n is equal to 4. Uh, no, sorry, no. Um, n plus 1 is equal to 4, because the number of points is n plus 1. n plus 1 is equal to 4. So then, n minus 1 is equal to 2. And that's the number of equations we get. That's the size of our square matrix. So we get a 2 by 2 matrix. And now we set up this 2 by 2 matrix, which is easy. 2 times h0 plus h1. I mean, yeah. Uh, then h1, h1, and this uh, uh, 2 times h1 plus h2. And this is, I mean, it's quite simple. This is 2 and this is 2, so we get this square matrix. And now the, the two right-hand sides, we get R1, um, I mean this is just the formula for the right-hand side, so we take the y values y2 minus y1. y2 is 1, y1 is 0, so this is 1. y1 minus, oh no, sorry, sorry, let me, uh, what was y2? Maybe we should write the points on the blackboard. So the points are 0, 0, 1, 1, um, 2, 0, and 3, 1. Okay, and this is number 0, 1, 2, 3. And now um, y2 minus y1 is minus 1. So this is minus 1, and this is 1 minus 0 is plus 1. So we get minus 6, minus 6 is minus 12. And similarly here, we get 12 as a result. And so now our linear system is this here. Okay, any questions? And now you solve this linear system and get as a result y1 double prime is minus 4, y2 double prime is 4, y0 double prime is equal to y3 double prime is equal to 0. I mean this is not part of the solution of this. This is what we know already because we want to determine a cubic, 
uh, sorry, uh, natural spline, and these are the conditions for a natural spline. Okay. Um, and now um, we go into this blue box uh, where we determine these A, I, B, I, C, I, and D, I. So now we go into this box here. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's quite simple. These di, they are just the yi. So um, d1 is 1 and d2 is 0. And that's what you. Um, let me see. Ah, yeah. <laughs> You don't see it here. I mean, this is not D1. And this is not D2. Why? Just because of this reason here. Look, from, from these terms here, X1 is a number. What is X1? Zero. X2 is one. So you have numbers in here. And when you multiply this third power out here, you would get constant terms, linear terms, quadratic terms, and cubic terms. And then you have to sort it all out in order to get something like that. So here are uh, two steps missing. So in the first step, you go into this blue box and replace the double prime variables to get these a, i, b, i, c, i, and d, i. And when you have these guys, then you, these are not um, a0, a1, and a2. Huh? Then you substitute them here, um, multiply it out, and that's what you get as a result here. Okay? Is this all clear? I mean, you could do as a first little exercise the steps, the two steps from here to there. Okay. And here we see the graph of our spline again. And I don't know whether it's necessary to repeat, but let me do it. This is, I mean, it is one function. The curve you see on this uh, slide is one function. But it's glued together from three cubic polynomials. And the first cubic polynomial might look like, let me see, yeah, might look like this. And the second cubic polynomial might look like this. And the third might look like this. And we just uh, take from each of these polynomials a well-defined part for the appropriate interval. And then we get not this chaotic picture, but we get this. Okay, I mean, that's enough about application of cubic spline functions. And that's what we, we wouldn't call mathematics. Now comes mathematics. I mean, math is about, are we allowed to do this? Um, and um, how complex it is, and so on. And of course, proving whether we are allowed to do this, and in which case we are allowed to do this. So now let's go into the math a little bit. 
Yeah, it's about correctness and complexity. Yeah? I mean, what is correctness? Look, I mean, I presented an algorithm how you can determine such coefficients. But uh, are you sure that this algorithm always gives you coefficients that first so such that the, the final spline hits all the data points and fulfills all requirements. That's what we have to prove. Yeah? And next is the question about the, co the computational complexity. Our naive algorithm would have a complexity, uh, I mean the, the computation time, would be 4n to the power of 3, which would be very bad. And now I claim the complexity is just linear. It's just proportional to n, and that's it. Yeah, and we have to look at this. Before we uh, prove this, we need um, a new term, which is uh, diagonal dominance of a matrix. So for, a, for any square matrix, uh, such a matrix is called diagonally dominant if this um, inequality holds. Huh? And what does this say, this inequality? AII, absolutely. AII, these are the diagonal elements of the matrix. Huh? And Every diagonal element has to be absolutely greater than this sum. And this is a sum over k equal 1 to n of a i k. So the sum, the sum loops over the second index. So what is the second index? The second index is the column index. So the loop goes over one row of the matrix. Okay? So what this tells us is, I mean here we have the diagonal of the matrix and we are somewhere here in column number, uh, in, in row number i. Uh, so we are talking about this row here. And the inequality tells us that this diagonal element here has to be greater than the sum of all the other elements in the diagonal. I mean, so it's obvious why this is called diagonally dominant. Uh, because the diagonal dominates the whole row. And this is, of course, about absolute values. I mean, that's kind of the, the weight, the weight of the whole row here compared to the diagonal. Yeah. And actually it is obvious, oh no, uh, sorry, I mean this is just a definition. Yeah, now let's look at this theorem here. This is a theorem from linear algebra. Um, a linear system, Ax equal b, is uniquely solvable if A is diagonally dominant. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? It is. And second, in the Gaussian elimination, neither row nor column swapping is needed. I mean, this is what you know already. Why don't we need any row or column exchanges in the Gaussian elimination. Why? When it does not end to echelon form. Excuse me? When it does not end to echelon form, where we can find the equation, we don't, uh, we don't need to change the column and rows. Yeah, but I mean, uh, how do you find an equation? What does that mean? I mean, the question is about elimination. Point where that is a clone form and all the uh, fourth row is becomes zero. You couldn't find any value. 
then you have to assume a value for <coughs> if the row is zero if the whole row is zero then you are having a problem but you already have a problem if one element is zero and which element, when is it a problem? Which element uh, must be zero in order to get the problem? The one in the diagonal, yes, yes. Okay, so we are having a severe problem if the whole row is zero. But we already have a problem if the diagonal element is zero. Okay, so um, it may not occur to have one zero row. Because what happens if there is a zero row in the matrix, in a square matrix? Singular. It's singular, yes. The matrix is singular and then there is no chance to apply Gaussian elimination because there is no solution. Huh? Okay, so we, we do have non-zero rows. All rows have to be non-zero. But if such a row is non-zero, what do we then know about the diagonal element? Of course it is non-zero either, why? Because, because of this condition, because it's diagonally dominant. Huh? Okay, so this is simple, we see this already. Huh? Yeah. And this is, I mean, it's obvious, but it's not, not so easy to prove. Huh? Okay. But, um, now let's uh, think of our spline problem. I mean, we are talking about computing our spline coefficients. And we are talking about solving such a tri-diagonal matrix. And now look at this matrix. And this matrix is diagonally dominant. Why is it? Look at it. Why is this matrix diagonally dominant? Except the diagonal elements all others are zero. No, 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 no. That's not true. We have three elements which are non-zero, not just one. Three. It's a sum and we multiply by two. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Let's let's uh, look at it on the board. Let's take row number three. And there we have H2, two times H2 plus H3, and H3. And now the absolute value of the diagonal is and this is greater than H2 plus H3 which is the sum of these two. Why is this greater than this? Oh, sorry, here. Because this is twice as much as this. And two times the number is greater than the number, but only if this number is non-zero. Uh, and only if the number is not negative. Otherwise, it would be smaller. But we are talking about absolute values. And that's and now you see it's necessary to talk about the absolute values, otherwise this wouldn't hold. But I mean, what about the question um, This might be zero. And then this wouldn't hold either because then we would have equal. OK. 
Can this happen? No, it can't happen. Why? Yes, H2 and H3 is the distance between these two, between two points. And so the, the whole thing reduces to the question, can the distance between two points be zero? No, why not? Because the first condition that the x points have to be different is pink. Um, we had this condition when we talked about polynomial interpolation. But now we talk about spline interpolation. We did not have this condition yet for splines. But we will add this condition for the splines. So also for spline interpolation, we will require um, any two x values of points to be different. Okay? But we will have an even stronger requirement. Um, let's look at an example. Suppose H 3 is equal to 2 and h2 is equal to minus 2. And then here we would have 0 equal to 0 and this wouldn't hold. And I mean here all the points are distinct. But, I mean, why is this not so nice? Yeah, because <laughs> this doesn't work. Yeah? Um, so, what, but what, uh, what is our new requirement? It is stronger than just uh, claiming all points are different. The observed value. Absolute, absolute, absolute value of x. No. This is not not enough. This is not enough. But if we take all the distances positive? Yes. All the distances have to be positive. And this results in x uh, sorry. X zero is less than x one is less than x two and so on up to xn. That's our new requirement. Huh? And you will see in the second next theorem, this will be the first requirement for the theorem. Look here, this is the theorem about spline interpolation. Let all these x, so it's exactly this requirement. So if this is true, then there is a unique cubic spline interpolant S of x with our natural spline condition. Well, and this can be calculated in linear time by the method described above. Um, I mean, method described above. This is the tri-diagonal tri matrix algorithm. Oh, actually, I mean, sorry, this would mean described below because this comes right here. Huh? But now again, let's look at this first proposition. There is a unique cubic spline interpolant. And now let's go back to this theorem. I mean, this immediately follows from this theorem because we have shown that the coefficient matrix for our spline problem is diagonally dominant. And so from this theorem we know that it has a unique solution. And that's why we can write here that there is a unique cubic spline interpolant. So the proof is easy. Proof is easy. Um, and now the, the, the only thing that remains is 
that we can calculate the solution of this tridiagonal linear system in linear time. And that's what I will show you now. Now look, our linear system has a form like that. Three diagonals. There is this main diagonal, uh, which is... Look at this main diagonal not as a diagonal, but as a vector. And then this would be a vector with these components B1 through Bn. And then we have these two, the left diagonal and this right diagonal, uh, which are vectors with the components C1 through Cn minus 1. And actually this matrix is symmetric. So we have this C vector here again. And it's really a good idea to look at these diagonals, not as, di as diagonals, but as vectors. Yeah? Because uh, when you program this in Octave or Mathematica, or whatever language, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you would naively program it, first of all, it would be difficult. Second of all, it would cost you extremely much storage. And third, it would be slow. So please do not store the matrix as a matrix, because you would store actually only zeros. Only zeros with these three diagonals. Look, if this is a thousand by thousand matrix, there are one million matrix elements. How many would be non-zero from these one, one million, approximately? How many would be non-zero? Three thousand, yes. Three thousand out of one million, so which we would be 0.3% of all the matrix elements would be non-zero. Or, in other words, 99.7% of all the matrix elements would be zero. Huh? So you would be storing just zeros. And they would remain zero all the time. So please do not store all these zeros. What you store on you in your program is not three, two vectors. You store this vector B and the vector C. And, I mean, you have this vector C twice. Huh? Okay, and there also, of course, is this vector D, the right-hand side vector. Huh? And now, how do we do elimination on this matrix? I mean, we will actually use Gaussian elimination, but, of course, we will not eliminate these guys here, because they are already zero. So. Um, in Gaussian elimination, in order to eliminate um, here, this column, the algorithm would run over this whole column. The, this has a length of n. But the algorithm, of course, would uh, manipulate the whole row. Yeah? And this for all, I mean here this row, this row, so the number of, of uh, arithmetic operations would be proportional to n squared. For eliminating one element uh, below the, or one column below the diagonal, it would take us n squared operations in the Gaussian algorithm n square for this column, n square for this, and so on. And that's why we had n cube in Gaussian. But here, we just have to eliminate this one element here. And this goes in constant time. Then we eliminate this, and this, and so on. So we have n times constant time, and that's why the Gaussian elimination in this particular case is, uh, goes in linear time. Okay, and here we have the formula. Yeah, I mean, what, what do we do? We want to eliminate this element, C1. And now we add a multiple of the first row to the second row. 
which multiple do we have to add here? I mean, we have to multiply this B1 by C1 divided by B1. Oh, yes, yes. We have to multiply the first row by C1 divided by, D, by B1. Huh? And then subtract it from the second row. And that's why this factor M is CK minus 1 divided by BK minus 1. For the second row, we need C1 divided by B1. For the kth row, we need CK minus 1 divided by BK minus 1. And then, of course, um, this is the formula to modify the diagonal elements. For this element here, which is B2, let's write it, B2. We have to add, um, we have to compute B2 minus um, C1 times M. And that's what we have here. BK is BK minus M times CK minus 1. Um, yeah. So this is the formula for modifying the diagonal elements of the matrix. And now we do, of course, the same thing on the right-hand side, which is this here. Huh? And now let me ask a question. So we have, look, here we have two modifications. The diagonal element will be modified and the right-hand side. But now, I mean, actually, we want to eliminate this guy. Why don't we apply our operation to this guy? We have to apply it to this, 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 and this. Oh yes, actually, we should, we should uh, do four modifications, but we just do two of them. We only apply the whole thing to um, this guy and this one. But how about this one and this one? That's the question. We do nothing with these. Why? Because C1 is meant to be zero. And the, the, the C1 you talk about this one, C1. Yeah? Going to be zero. It is going to be zero. We already know it will be zero. So we don't have to manipulate it. We know it already. Okay, we know it will be zero. So we can just set it equal zero. But we even don't do this. Why don't we need to set it zero? Because in, we know it will be zero. And we don't need it. I mean, we just leave it as it was. And in the following, of course, we will need the diagonal and we will need this upper diagonal. But this upper diagonal, now how about this, this, this one, this guy here? Why don't we do anything on this one? Well, that's simple, because we will subtract from it a multiple of zero. So nothing will happen. So this upper diagonal will remain. It won't change. Okay, so that's simple, and that's the elimination algorithm. Um, yeah, and now this is the backward substitution. Look, after the elimination, we have eliminated this lower diagonal. And then we can immediately compute xn. Xn is equal to dn divided by bn. And now I, we will do an, 
a next step of optimization, we actually won't uh, define a variable, I mean a vector x of the solution values. We will store all the solutions into the vector of the right hand side. And so we, we, even, we save a little bit of storage. And that's why here we say dn is equal to dn divided by bn. Actually, this, of course, this is xn, but uh, I mean, this variant saves a little bit of uh, storage. And then for all the other um, um, rows going back up, we have this formula. So we replace. Um, for example here, when we know xn, we will substitute xn by the value we know and then compute xn minus 1 and so on, back up the whole uh, system. Okay, so this is the algorithm. It's really easy, it's easy to implement and it is fast. It's very fast. And this is actually the reason why cubic spline interpolation is very popular and successful. Um, this linear complexity means if you have twice as many points, it takes you twice as much computational time. And uh, so this is not really a problem. If it would be cubic, then you really would have to be careful when you have lots of points. Okay, ah, okay, uh, here you do have the proof. We already discussed this here on the blackboard. This is just for the script. Um, now let's talk about um, other alternatives for these first and last points. For, the, for these two points, we can select some two arbitrary requirements. What we did was this natural spline condition here. But we could do something different. Suppose maybe you are not happy with having second derivative zero on the margins. Maybe you know uh, here the curvature must be um, negative and here it must be positive. Then you would say second derivative as double prime at x zero must be maybe minus 2 and here on the right margin it might be plus 2, whatever. Huh? So you, you just can give these values. Um, or maybe this is also a nice idea. Um, the second derivative should be constant on the border. And this constant on the border means for example like that, this means the curvature on this point here and on this point must be the same. Yeah. I mean what is the curvature? That's the radius of a circle uh, which has the same second derivative here. So the, this radius here and here must be the same. And also here on the last two points. Okay. And here, of course, also we, we might specify the first derivative. So I can say the first derivative at the first point has to be zero. And that would mean Suppose we have it like that, and that would mean a horizontal tension, it should start like that. So that would be S prime of x0 is equal to 0, and here we would have S prime of xn is equal to minus 1 maybe. Okay, first derivative given at the border. Um, yeah, and here we have some nice uh, condition too. Let's show it on this picture. Whenever we have periodic functions, 
then we should, uh, we should use this choice. Look, suppose we have a periodic function where this is one period from here to there. And then if the function is periodic, of course it should repeat here. <coughs> and this repetition means, um, oh no, let me give you a counterexample and you will see why you need such a condition. Um, yes. Yeah, suppose we are given these points for one period of the function. And we would now fit a natural spline. What would we get? We would get something like that. And now if we periodically continue the whole thing, then we would get something like that. Which is not nice at all. Why? Oh, maybe you like it, but I don't like it. It's not uh, continually differential. Yes. And not even two times continuously differentiable. Because of these uh, corners here. This is not allowed. We don't want this. And so now what is our new requirement? Look, what we have here is just a repetition of this. So our requirement must be S prime of x0 has to be S prime of xn. The first derivative here and here has to be the same. And that's what makes the problem here. And of course, the same thing for the second derivative. S double prime of x0 has to be S double prime of xn. These are the two conditions we have to add if we are talking about periodic functions. Um, but now, oh yes, I'm sorry, I mean this, this uh, picture is not correct. Sorry. So if we would get this um, as one period of the function, then of course it would continue like that. Which is even worse. It's even not continuous. So we would have, or we will have to add a third requirement, which is s of x0 is equal to s of xn. But this is not a requirement for our spline calculation process. This is a requirement on our data points. So this is actually um, y0 has to be y equal to yn. If this is not the case, you can forget about uh, wanting a periodic function. I mean, you, you will get a periodic function, but it won't be continuous. So uh, getting a continuous periodic spline is only possible if this, is, uh, if this holds. If this holds and you add these two requirements, then you can get a continuous periodic spline. No, a two times continuously differentiable uh, periodic spline. Okay, that's it about splines. Um, any questions? Okay, yeah, then let's continue talking about spline curves. Up to now we talked about spline functions. 
But in many applications, we don't have functions, we just have curves. Look at such an example. For example, maybe in aerodynamics, when you construct an airplane, uh, you want to design the shape of the wings. And then the engineer, on his uh, CAD computer, he might fix a number of points and then call his uh, spline uh, function to you know, interpolate this. But with what we learned up to now, this does not work. Why? We have two values for one x yes. value. Yes, that's the point. For one x value, you have two values. Or in other words, what we have here is not a function because, I mean, a function has to be unique. For every x, you need a unique y. Um, how is this called in mathematics? Oh no, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's exactly not a one-to-one -one because it would be if it would be a one-to-one -one correspondence, it would be a function. About the real functions. Real valued functions. I mean, you're right. A one-to-one -one correspondence is a subclass of all functions. I mean, that's what we strictly call bijective functions. But this is, I mean, by no means is it this functions. Um, it is not a function at all. What is it? I mean, how would you call it intuitively? You might call it a curve. But there is a, a more technical term. It's called relation. This is a relation. And what is a relation? A relation is a set of ordered pairs. And what are ordered pairs? Ordered pairs in R2 are points. Points. This is a set of points, isn't it? Yeah. It's, an, it's a, set of, a set of points. Huh? No, I wouldn't call it contour. Because contour lines then is when we are in three-dimensional space and then we are talking about contour lines. But we are still in, in two-dimensional space. Call it a curve, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, and now the question is how can we do spline in such a context? We cannot apply our algorithm as we had it. But with a tiny little trick, we actually can apply the algorithm exactly as we had it. And this little trick is, it is called parametric representation of our curve. Who has ever heard about parametric representation of curves? That's nice, because you attended my lecture last semester. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really unfortunate, because this should really be a part of a bachelor math course. Now let me show you what's that. And there is a, a well-known example, which is the unit circle. Oh, no, no, don't take the unit circle. We take a circle with radius r, okay? What is the formula for this circle in R2? Who knows it? Raise your hands. 
Yes. Thank you. X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. That's the formula for this circle. But unfortunately, I mean, that's an equation. That's not a function. We typically want to have uh, functions y depending on x. And of course, we can get it if we bring this to the right hand side, and then we get, would get plus or minus square root of r squared minus x squared. Okay? And then everything is fine, and we have a function. No. What's the problem? Two solutions, the plus and the minus here. And you can see it. Take some x, and then you have two solutions. This is not a function. It is only a function if you take the upper branch or the lower branch. If we take the upper branch, then we delete the minus and everything is fine. If we want the lower branch, we take the minus and everything is fine. But the whole unit circle is not a function. And that's not nice. But we can solve the problem. We can make a function out of it. How do we solve this problem? Divided into ranges? Into ranges? Hmm. You would say we let x go between 0 and r or something like that? Yeah. That wouldn't help us. It would even be sufficient to divide the whole curve into two parts. That's what we, what we did right now. But that's not the solution. I want to have uh, one function for the whole circle. And the solution is called parametric representation. Um, and in this particular case, for the, for the circle, uh, the solution is, is called polar coordinates. And maybe you have heard about this. Yeah? Um, so polar coordinates means we look at some point here. And then we look at this triangle. And here we have x, here we have y. And here we have some angle alpha. Yeah? And now we can write our trigonometric equations. We can write x is a equal to um, r times the sine, no, sorry, the cosine of alpha. And y is equal to r times the sine of alpha. OK? And now we have introduced this new variable alpha, which is the parameter. Huh? Which is the parameter. And actually, this alpha here, if you measure it in, uh, in radians, then this alpha is proportional to the line, uh, to the length of this line when we start from this point. Now, and we start with alpha uh, equals zero from here, then the angle is proportional to the length of this line. And now, the nice thing is that we get a unique pair of values, x and y, for any alpha between 0 and 2 pi. We get even unique values for any alpha between minus n plus infinity. No problem at all. 
we get a unique x and y no matter how often we go around here. And why is this? Yeah, because, I mean, if we take this function, this is the cosine, and the cosine gives you unique values between minus and plus infinity, and the sine too. And this is a parametric representation of the unit circle. And now we could do nice, uh, nice things. We might, let's uh, add uh, times e to the power minus alpha here. This is completely new and different. It's no longer a unit circle. But tell me, how does now the new curve we get, how does it look like? Let's look here. I mean, this is with the cosine. How would it look? It? The amplitude, the amplitude decreases, yes. So it would be something like that. And with the sign similarly. But now what would be the result up here? It would be, it would go around still, yes. But how? Uh, it's a spiral. Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah. we would get something like that. So that's nice playing. Just do it. Use it with, for example, Mathematica. In Mathematica there is a command called parametric plot. And parametric plot has, of course, two function arguments. You enter this guy and this guy and you would, you would get nice images. Okay. Now what we do here in our spline application is as input we have this table of points x and y values. And now what we do is we give numbers to these points and these numbers look the numbers we count them number 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. And these numbers, they, we use them as a parameter. Look, the parameter was kind of the length of the line. And now we would like to have the length of this line as a parameter. So we just add the parameter as a new variable. Look, from such one point we produce a new point, tk, xk, we add a parameter. And the same parameter will be added here. So we get two new tables. And that's good because finally we want to have two functions depending on this one parameter. Now look again. This was our original table. The number xk, yk. And now we take the number of the kind of the new x value this is the new y value for table 1. Here we get table 2 with our original y values. And now, the good thing is that this table now represents a function. This represents a function. Because, why does it represent a function? Because this variable, which is the new x variable, is strictly monotonically increasing. So it really goes from left to right. Look, the problem is here it goes from right to left and then from left to right and, and that means our x values repeat. But, I mean, if you do something like that, then you get a function. So this is a function and that's a function. Now we apply our spline algorithm exactly as we know it to this table and also to this table, then the spline algorithm will return two functions 
And then you use parametric plot with these two functions and you're finished. That's it. I mean, taking the number of the points as our parameter is not really an optimal choice because, look, the distance between these two points is much bigger than the distance between these two. We would actually, we would better use the real distance between the points. So as a parameter, we no longer take the number. It is better to take um, the old value plus the Euclidean distance between two points. And what's the Euclidean distance? That's Pythagoras. Huh? Um, and that's what we have here. Okay, so that's the way how to calculate a spline curve. Uh, a spline curve. Huh? First step is to add our parameter va variable, so these two new columns. But now we don't use the number, we use the the estimated length of the curve, so which is the old length plus the Pythagoras distance. So now the parameter really is an estimate this length plus this length plus this length is the parameter value here. And the parameter value here is plus uh, the straight line difference and so on. So that's a really nice and elegant ex extension of spline functions to spline curves. And of course there is also an exercise here. I mean, once you programmed your uh, spline algorithm for functions, that's a really easy extension. I mean, this is kind of uh, three extra lines of code and then you have it for all spline curves. And this finishes our spline chapter, yes. And on Thursday we will talk about the least squares uh, function approximation technique. Thank you.